doing this on my phone today because my iPad is not charged. It's Tuesday evening and it's been a strange day and I wonder whether you have had strange days. And I have decided to start reading a Prelude to the Landing on Earth. I have been reading a book called uh, The Only Planet of Choice over this or July and August. And um, I had already read this uh, almost a decade ago uh, and I ordered another copy which arrived a couple of days ago and I decided to read this aloud too uh, because there's magic in here and I thought everybody could maybe do with a little bit of magic. So I am simply going to read a book called Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth it's written by Stuart Holwright, and I shall read every little bit of it. So, sleeve notes. It was published in 1977, and it is a journey into consciousness, really. It will explain in the sleeve note, which we always read first, isn't it? Lovely cover, isn't it? Either the most bizarre thing happening on the planet today, or the most important, was how a distinguished scientist described the story that this book tells. It begins at Ossining, Ossining, O-S-S-I-N-I-N-G, a small self-contained estate not far from New York, where a group of people, including a scientist, an English aristocrat, and four psychics, have spent the last few years communicating with extraterrestrials who wish to make contact with Earth. It has been suggested that they might use psychic channels to make such contact, or even intervene on our television and radios. This book is based on some 200 hours of these communications. Stuart Holroyd brings a skeptical, informed and open mind to the task of expounding and assessing this material and in doing so unfolds an astonishing and gripping narrative. Here is information that challenges established beliefs of scientists, historians, anthropologists and theologians. Here are exposures of political machinations, rumours of wars and grounds to hope for lasting peace in the world. Here too is a human story of three temperamentally different people yoked together in a strange and exacting mission and of the conflicts that arise when they are under stress and under a cosmic microscope. It is a story that forces us to consider that personal change in each of us is perhaps essential to human survival and which suggests that many may be on the threshold of a dramatic and transforming event that could be the most important ever to take place on this earth. Prelude to the planning, landing on the planet of Earth was published in 1977 and it is published by Butler and Tanner. Author's note. This book is about people going through a very testing and unusual experience and I want to express my appreciation to the principals for both, both for their unstinting cooperation and for permitting the personal aspects of the story to be told. One problem in writing about contemporary events of this kind is that words tend to fix and finalise things. And I should like to stress that this is an ongoing story, and that in the two years that have elapsed since the events here reported, some of the people involved have undergone considerable and beneficial personal change as a result of their experiences and their strange guidance. Others have chosen to drop into the background. However, in these two years the communications have continued further elaborating the themes introduced in this book and bro broaching some new ones. This book is only the beginning, and a book on the extraordinary events and communications subsequently to the April 1975 climatic, climateric will follow. To reproduce a verbatim, the material on which the book is based would require three or four volumes of the present length, so the material as presented in these pages is edited. I have omitted repetitions and some digressions and have tidied up grammar and syntax where necessary, simply in order to make the narrative readable and to include as much of the very varied material as possible. 
My thanks are due to Nada Yolanda and Mark, Incorporated of Miami, for per permission to quote from their publications, Visitors from Other Planets, to Brad Steiger, Englewood Cliff, New Jersey, for permission to quote from a revelation, The Divine Fire by Brad Steiger. As a little note, as it is sometimes in books, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10, verse 10-11. Contents. Da -da -da -da. Chapter 1. Preposterous Propositions. How this bizarre, bizarre story is going to end at the time of writing is anybody's guess. But let me go back to how it began, at least for me. On a visit to the United States in January 1975, I was staying with a friend in Rockland Country, South County, some 30 miles upriver from New York, and happened to mention that a friend in London had given me the phone number of Sir John Whitmore, who was living somewhere in New York State at a place called Ossinin. That's just across the river, my friend said, so we called up Sir John and arranged to go over to Ossinin for lunch the following Sunday. In the spring of 1974, Whitmore and others had organised in London a symposium and series of public lectures on the frontiers of science and medicine, which I had attended in order to, intend, attended in order to write some articles on the proceedings. I had met John. In future references, I shall drop the honorific, as he has chosen to do so. Several times in the course of the May lectures and subsequently on one of two occasions, but at the time I knew little of his background or work. We were not close acquaintances, uh, but since we were, as I thought, fortuitously, fortuitously in the same area, it seemed natural to pay him a social visit. Osinin. The name rang a bell, but I couldn't recall in what connection. I kept scanning my memory banks for the connection on, on and off all through the Sunday, but it continued to elude me. I didn't worry too much at it, though, particularly as the Sunday drew on for my host, Richard Connolly, and I spent the afternoon and early evening at the High Tour Vineyards as guests of the viticulture Father Tom, Tom Hayes, who plied us with the excellent High Tour wines, which we contentedly discussed, drank and compared for hours, sitting cosily round a log fire while outside snow lay thick on the hillside which may seem a digression, but when you're into something as weird as I am at the present time, it can be helpful to establish your credentials as a fellow with a taste for normal, earthly and rational pursuits, such as drinking and talking about wine. The combination of jet lag and Tom's Hay High's tour red in wine ensured me a good night's sleep on the Saturday. So on Sunday we arrived in good time for lunch as our sinning. When I saw the mailbox outside the house we had been directed to, it bore the name Buharic. The connection that had eluded me came back in a flash. This was the home of Andrija Buharic, the maverick scientist who had brought Yuri Geller to America and whose book Yuri, which, had read some, which I had read some months before, recounted some very queer goings on at Osini, such as materialization, telling a very tall story. The maverick scientist who had brought Yuri Geller to America and whose book Yuri, which I had read some months before, recounted some very queer goings on in Suning as at Osinin, such as materialization and disappearance, reappearance events, as well as telling a very tall story about communications with extraterrestrial intelligences and sighting of UFOs. I had met Puharaj briefly in London at the May lectures, where he had given a literally incredibly incredible talk in which he solemnly declared that he and Geller had been contacted by extraterrestrial beings to bear witness to their existence and their powers and to prepare man mankind for a meeting with these beings at some unspecified future date when they would make mass landings on Earth. Subsequently, I had done some homework on Puharic in order to write my article and also my interest in the man was aroused and I found he had done some very original and impressive 
parapsychological research work on correlations between environmental electromagnetic fields, field forces, and processes of paranormal cognition. He had scientifically investigated. Some of the outstanding psychic, psychics of recent years, such as Eileen Garrett, Peter Hurkos, and the Brazilian miracle healer Arrigo, healer Arrigo, and he had invented an electrical device for applying radio waves of controlled frequency directly to the skin, which could be used for alleviating deafness, accelerating blood and controlling blood clotting. The man was clearly a highly original, gifted and versatile scientist, and I would have thought nobody's fool. But it was equally clear that he had made something of a fool of himself in the eyes of the scientific community by writing as sensationally as he did about Geller and UFOs and contacts with beings from other parts of the cosmos. I had heard various opinions of him, expressed ranging from admiration to regret, a good mind gone off on tangent, and derision, a classic case of omnipotency fa fantasy. But I didn't know what to make of the man. It would be interesting to meet him again on his home ground, though. I filled Richard in on some of his background as we drove up to the big detached house, and while we waited for someone to answer our door, we, we looked at each other. John Whitmore answered and welcomed us warmly. John is tall, athletic, fair-haired, about 40, re 40 years old, wears a neat beard, talks and moves energetically, and has successfully shed his past persona of public schoolboy. Sandhurst, subaltern, professional racing driver, country gentleman and international tycoon. His manner and dress are casual, his speech is English, English with some American overturns and turns of phrase, and he's, going, he's outgoing and enthusiastic. Some people, also think, some people also think he's crazy, but at that point, that's a point on which I think we'd better withhold judgment. So, Sir John took us into a big sitting room where there were some plush couches and chairs and the atmosphere was a bit unlived in and lacking the clutter of a home, except that a solitary bottle of Vic Vaporot stood out conspicuously on a low table. He introduced us to a pretty oriental-looking woman, young woman named Melanie, whose manner was almost overwhelmingly effusive, intimate and caring right from the first moment but who for the rest of the day kept getting my name wrong and kept calling me Stephen. John mentioned that Melanie had worked with Andrija and Yuri, and I recalled that she was frequently mentioned in Puharic Geller, Geller book. Puharic himself wasn't around. He was in bed, suffering from some minor malady, but he gathered Melanie thought was symptomatic of nervous exhaustion and overwork, and for which she had prescribed total rest. So he wouldn't be down, which was a pity. Though, if he had been, I wonder if he would have got a word in, for as soon as we've got through the initial pleasantries, John launched into what was virtually a monologue, which was to keep Richard and me pretty enthralled for the next three hours. The enthrallment, in fact, might have been total, if we had not had a bottle of high tour to pass, back and forth, and some definite prospect of the lunch we had been invited for. Noises suggestive of preparation for the latter event em emanated from a distant part of the house. Clattering of crockery, chattering of women's voices, but nobody came in to announce that lunch was served. A, a toddler came into the room a couple of times in the three hours, and a young woman, presumably the mother, appeared and whisked the child away. There were four women in the house, John explained, and three of them were psychics, who were helping with the work. They lived as a community, and he had bought a neighbouring house which he would show us in due course. The two houses comprised a small estate and they were putting two acres of land under cultivation so that they could grow their own food. Their ultimate aim was that the community should be as self-sufficient as possible. They had even installed a generator and laid down several thousand gallons of diesel fuel. The purpose of all this was that if any crisis arose they would be able to continue with the work that they were engaged on. Richard and I were intrigued. What work would involve a renegade and prodigal English aristocrat and a maverick American scientist sh shutting themselves away in our sinning with four women? Well, John said, he was going to tell us, because although a lot of the work was still highly confidential, the time was coming when it would have to be more widely known. 
even though those involved still had some doubts about the source and nature of the information they had got, they felt the time had come when they had to lay their reputation on the line and with appropriate reticence seek means of getting the information across to more people. Maybe I would be able to help. John had liked the fair and open-minded way I had written up the May lectures material, so at the risk of sending us away thinking him nuts, he was going to tell us. I was familiar with the general situation already, having heard Andrija's talk in London and read his book on Yuri, but Andrija has only told a fraction of the story. Since March 1974, they had been in constant contact with the management, i.e. the extraterrestrial intelligences, and they now had tape recordings of over 100 hours of communications with them. I recall that in America, that I recall that in Andrija's book, there was quite a lot about communications with extraterrestrials. Andrija and Yuri had found that if they placed a tape recorder on a table between them and waited, sometimes the start button would be pressed down by some paranormal agency and a message would be imprinted directly on the tape. Two-way conversations had also been held in this way, some of which Andrija had descri described verbatim in his book, but unfortunately none of these recordings were available for others to hear, for as soon as Andrija had transcribed, transcribed their contents, the cassettes had dematerialized, very conveniently. Andrija's critics had mocked, but that was a point which I had wondered about. If Andrea were simply a liar, he, would, with his, he could, with his expertise in electronics, quite easily have produced some recordings of synthetic speech to support his claim. But, by claiming that these, thing, these beings he was in contact with first directly imprinted speech sounds on tape, then made the cassettes dematerialize, he was compounding the improbabilities and certainly not speaking in a manner calculated to enhance his own credibility. I had puzzled over that without reaching any plausible explanations of Andre's motivation other than the most absurd one that he was telling the truth. But now it seemed the management had become less coy and had allowed 100 hours of their communications to remain intact on tape. That really was rather interesting because to synthesize that much speech out of electronic signals would have been no mean task. But John explained that it wasn't exactly like that. In the present case, the management had referred to use human channel, that is, mediums, in deep trance. That, I thought, was disappointing. I had read quite a bit about trance mediumship and spiritualism, and I knew that although there were a few classic cases that still defied explanation, most of the phenomena could be explained in terms of abnormal psychology or extrasensory perception. A century of psych psychical research and tens of thousands of hours of communications with an alleged discarnate spirit had failed to turn up any really conclusive evidence for the existence of such entities, and it seemed to me that the existence of the management, if it was attested so, only by mediumistic phenomena, must be equally, if not even more, dubious. I kept these thoughts to myself, because you don't argue rationally you don't argue rationally with a man once you begin to suspect he's just a misguided crank but john must have either anticipated or intuited my objections for he went on to explain that he had gone through months of doubt and suspicion during which he had examined every possible explanation of the communications that he could think of that they emanated from the medium subconscious minds, that they came telepathically from the participants, particularly Andrija, and even some of the whole thing was like a hoax designed to relieve him of some of his considerable inherited fortune. And finally, he had had to reject all these normal explanations and accept that the communication was and is at its face value. Of course, he expected others to have the same problems and questions as he had, and he didn't expect others to make the same kind of commitment as he was making, for as he saw, it had nothing. To, for as he saw, if, as he saw it, he had nothing to lose except his money, whereas others might well feel that commitment would put their reputation and their careers and even their families' lives, lives in jeopardy. Andrija was a case in point. He had lost much more than he could possibly have gained by his involvement. 
His professional credibility was tarnished, and his previous work in this area had not helped his marriage. There were in fact quite a few eminent people who knew about the work, and would probably become active in it at the right time, but who for the present had to sit on the fence in order to safeguard their professional integrity and credibility. As far as he himself was concerned, John felt that the wealth he had inherited and the freedom of movement and independence it had given him had been a preparation for the role he was to play. The main thing that had convinced him that the communications were not a run-of-the-mill psych psych uh, psychical phenomenon but emanated from an external source was the range and variety of the information they conveyed. The management had been observers of the Earth's history for millennia and had intervened in it on several occasions in the past, and their communications contained a wealth of detail about the origins and progress of civilizations, the origins of languages and mythologies, and the roles of historical figures. Also, there was an entire cosmology comprising information about five different extraterrestrial civilizations, their interrelations, their technologies, <laughs> Oh. And I don't know whether this is even going on. I might just do this for myself. Mm -hmm. it keeps falling down. Okay. The main thing that had convinced him that the communications were not a run-of-the-mill psych psychical phenomenon but emanate, emanated from an external source was the range and variety of the information they had conveyed. The management had been observers of the Earth's history for millennia and had intervened in, in it on several occasions in the past and their communications contained a wealth of detail about the origins, progress of civilizations, the origins of languages and mythologies and the role of historical figures. Also. There was an entire cosmology comprising information about five different extraterrestrial civilizations, their interrelations, their technology, and about how the Earth related to this cosmic scheme. The management knew about contemporary political situations and events on Earth, and sometimes gave some intriguing information about what went on behind the scenes, and they were particularly concerned about the Middle East situation. And there was much more and there were other areas and subjects. There was a lot of wisdom and coherent teaching, and it was inconceivable, John thought, that all this could have emanated from the mind of the medium, or any of the participants, or even from all of them collectively. He had asked all the obvious questions about the provenance of the material, and how he was 95% satisfied that the communications were what they claimed to be, and he was prepared to put it in abeyance, and he was prepared to put in abeyance the residual 5% of doubt, or rather incredulity, and come right out and declare in appropriate circles in the near future that he and the others as a sinning were in contact with beings from another part of the cosmos, who were benevolent, benevolent disposed towards the inhabitants of Earth, and were going to be amongst the near future in order to provide the guidance that we urgently needed at this critical juncture in history. Richard and I, as may be imagined, were somewhat stunned to be regaled with all of this instead, instead of with the anticipated lunch. It was a fascinating experience, something it would be fun to write about, and I enjoyed the novelty and irony of being able to do the old British act of showing off one of our aristocratic eccentrics to our American cousins in a situation that had the additional piquancy of taking place right on the American cousin's doorstep. Well, we all have our subjective defense mechanism against novelty and strangeness, and mine were such thoughts as these. The Queen and Alice in Wonderland reproached Alice for not having had enough practice in believing impossible things, and boasted that she sometimes believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, we were being asked to believe as many before lunch, and although I at least had some recent practice in suspending disbelief, I was still far from graduating in sheer credulity, and certainly wasn't prepared for the challenges of this particular wonderland. My sympathies were with Alice. About three o'clock, Melanie came in and asked if anyone would like to eat, 
as if it were a novel idea that had just occurred to her. So we went into another room where there were about ten people already assembled around a big table, colourfully laden with wholesome salads, cheeses, fruit and home-baked brown loaves. Conversations over lunch was largely about the absent Andrija, about how he tended to take too much on himself and how other members of the community might in future unobtrusively relieve him of some of the work. I sat between John and an elderly lady who turned to me once and volunteered the information that some days ago she had seen a cigar-shaped UFO hovering over Manhattan and was silent throughout the rest of the meal. After lunch, John took us around the estate. His own house was about 200 yards from our bridges, down a driveway, and between the two lay a, la a, a small lake. Adjoining his house was a large barn, which was in the process of being converted into a studio office with living quarters for guests. The house conversion, the big generator, the big generator, um, the ta tanks of stored fuel, the land under cultivation, all bespoke a substantial capital investment in the work. Finally, we were shown the place where it all happened, the cage. I had read in Adridge's book, Beyond Telepathy, Telepathy, about the use of a Faraday cage in his experiments with Eileen Garrett, but this was the ter first time I had seen such a structure. The Faraday cage is a rectangular metal, bo metal box of dimensions 8 by, f 8 by 12 feet, which is lined with copper and placed on insulating supports, and constitutes a complete electrical vacuum. When the door is shut, no electromagnetic waves can penetrate the cage, and the electrical environment within the cage can be controlled for experimental purposes. Inside the cage there were three chairs and a table, on which stood some expensive-looking recording equipment and a small portable TV set. John demonstrated the electromagnetic shielding property of the cage by switching on the TV set and slowly shutting the door of the cage. The picture remained on the screen up to the point when there was just about a quarter inch crack for the signal to get through. Then John sharply, sharply pulled the door shut, the screen became blank and I caught in Richard's eyes a fleeting expression of claustrophobic alarm, which I confess I momentarily felt too. I thought of Kurt Vonnegut's Billy Pilgrim in Pilgrim in the novel Slaughterhouse Five, who had been kidnapped by the little green men of the planet Trafalmador and caged in their zoo. There was an interesting story about how they had acquired the cage, John said. Some time ago, they had been having some technological difficulties in the communication session, and the management had indicated that some protective improvement had to be made in the system. The following day, out of the blue, Poorvich had received a call from a company that was going bankrupt and wanted to dispose of a Faraday cage cheaply and quickly. They had bought it and instantly found that their channeling problems were solved, and the communications came through much more easily when they held their sessions inside the cage. This was one of the many synchronistic events, Jung's terms for events that are meaningfully but non-causally connected. John said, which regularly happened in connection with their work, and which for them constituted further evidence of the objective reality of the management. When we were back in the sitting room and John had talked some more about the work, he finally got around to saying that he wondered whether our visit at this time was just a chance, social call or another of those synchronistic events. Perhaps the management had their eye on me, he said with a laugh. Perhaps they were behind this seemingly casual visit. Perhaps they wanted to use me in some way. I wasn't very comfortable with that idea, which again reminded me of the Tralfamadora on the fate of poor Pili, Billy Pilgrim. And that was that. I was in the States for a couple of weeks, but didn't pay another visit to Osinin. The visit had been an interesting experience and something to file away in memory for f possible future use in some form or another. A few days after, I had lunch in New York with a scientist from the Stanford Research Institute. I knew he was familiar with the Ossining setup, and I asked him what he thought of it. It's either the most bizarre and crazy thing happening on this planet, or it's the most important, he said. He was one of the fence sitters John had mentioned. To me, bizarre seemed just about the right word. That was just over a year ago from the time of this writing. I had a busy year, having contracted to complete three books and had virtually forgotten about Isening and the management, when, 
one day in September 1975, I received a transatlantic call from John. The work we had talked about that Sunday when I visited, he said, had been progressing and they had received definite indications from the management that it was time for a book about the communications to be written and published. Would I be interested? Of course. I didn't have to commit myself on the information I had at that time, but I was interested in principle. He would send me some tapes of the communications to listen to, and he would be able to meet and discuss the project in a few weeks' time when he would be in England. I agreed, considering that I had nothing to lose, and it would be interesting anyway to hear some of the communications. And a few days later the tapes arrived, together with some written background material about how the whole thing had started and the people involved in it. I received some odd books and comments from my family in the course of the next few days. On several occasions my wife or one of the children came into my study while I was listening and on hearing the queer sounds emanating from my hi-fi quite forgot the purpose of the call. I am regarded by friends and family as a fairly rational intellectual type and for me to be listening to communications with alleged space gods was considered amusingly offbeat. They soon became used to it though as I became used to the initial strangeness of the tapes. The strangeness is in the language, the syntax, the tone of the communications delivered through the channel, the medium Phyllis Slemmer, and also sometimes in the manner of the communications who are mainly John and Andrija, which can be embarrassingly differential and awed. I felt sometimes that I was eavesdropping on a very private ritual and sceptical questions kept occurring to me. Were these two clever men the dupes of a cleverer woman? It was a strange inconsistency that in many of the communications there was an excess of that's and offs and, and a number of circumlocutions, 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 which sounded like a deliberate, deliberate attempt to avoid literacy, whereas in others the language was incisive, uncluttered and sometimes even quite eloquent and aphoristic. Also, when John or Andrija asked a difficult question, the voice often said, we will consult. And there followed a long pause, during which the spokesman for the extraterrestrials was supposed to be said telepathically communicating with his peers, but which would be a pause to give Phyllis an opportunity to think up answer. But which could have been a pause for Phyllis to an opportunity to think up an answer. As Thomas Aquinas said, though not in so many words, it is unphilosophical, unscientific and ultimately unintelligent to invoke a supernatural explanation of a phenomenon before you have eliminated every natural explanation. When confronted with the weird and wonderful, a man's first reaction tends to be to try and rationalize it. And that's what I was doing all the time I was listening to those first tapes. I eventually became quite satisfied that the minimal hypothesis that of a deliberate fraud or hoax could be ruled out. I had some biographical material on Phyllis and a tape of her talking about herself and her life and I was satisfied not only that she could not possibly possess all the knowledge that she was channeling but also that she could have nothing to gain by deception, particularly as the sessions often severely depleted her physical and psychic energies. So my first hours of exposure to the communications convinced me that they were genuinely paranormal and of great that these were genuinely paranormal and of great interest. But the second minimal hypothesis, hypothesis was not so easily dismissed as the first. The second would be that they were normally paranormal, that is to say, attributal to telepathy or the emergence of a secondary personality in the medium's trance state. There are many precedents in the annals of physical psych psychical research of mysterious communications of considerable length and showing great ingenuity and powers of invention which have come through mediums and trance. There is the Patience Worth case recorded by Dr. Walter Franklin Prince in which a St. Louis housewife with an eighth grade education produced over a period of five years a million and a half words by automatic writing including long novels and poems and a wealth of aphrodisic wit and wisdom, all in highly literal, litera, literate and colloquial 17th century English. There's the contemporary case of the Brazilian trance author Chico Xavier, 
who has produced something like 130 books, allegedly posthumous works of known Brazilian writers, which are consistent in style and subject matter with the works those authors wrote while alive. There is the book A Vision, which the wife of the poet W.B. Yeats wrote in trance, and which contains a cosmology or a philosophy and a wealth of imagery that the poet drew on in composing in composing some of his greatest work. And there's the case of the Reverend Stainton Moses, Spiritual Teachings, which has some remarkable correspondence correspondences with the Orsini communications. Between 1872 and 1883, Stainton Moses filled 24 notebooks with automatic writing. His communicators purported to be illus illustrious biblical characters, and they informed their amusements that a missionary effort to uplift the human race was being made in the spirit realms, and he had been chosen as a channel for their communications. These are four classic cases of automatism, and there are scores of others, and the conclusion that Prince reached in his study of the patient's worth material applies to all of them. Either our concept of what we call the subconscious mind must be radically altered, so as to include potencies of which we hitherto have had no knowledge, or else some course operating through, but not originating in, the con subconscious of Mrs. Quran, the medium, must be acknowledged. The Arsenian communication, it seems to me, after I heard some hours of the recordings, posed the same dilemma. But this case differs from the other cases of paranormal communications above mentioned, in that the objective reality of the communicators is theoretically verifiable, for they claim to be actively engaged in the affairs of our world, to intervene in certain ways, and to be able to predict future events. And, as we shall see in later chapters, some of the statements, and particularly some of the predictions made in the communications, are very impressive. Another thing that puts this case in a different category from others is the amount of correlated activity the communicators have already engen engendered. Among the first batch of tapes I listened to was one about a trip to the Middle East, which John, Adrija and Phyllis made in November 1974 at the request of the management. The purpose of this trip was nothing less than to help avert an imminent crisis in the Middle East by influencing the Russian leaders in Moscow by meditation and the instruction of the management were that the three should make a crescent-shaped tour keeping within 1,500 miles of Moscow and should engage in meditation periodically in order to transmit the required psychic energy. To undertake such a trip obviously demanded a considerable investment, not only of money, but also of faith and trust, and on the face of the entire enterprise would appear to be crackpot and incredibly presumptuous. But the management said it was necessary, so off the three went from New York to Helsinki, then to Warsaw, Ankara, Tehran, Moscow, and back via Copenhagen, where they were assured that their mission had been a success. In explaining their strategy of psychic influence, the communicators showed a shrewd, shrewd insight into the Russian mind. They said, It is an emotional mind, but with great love and strong meditation, a simple mind may be made to feel, and then, in turn, come to some sense. There is a difference between a simple mind that thinks it is intelligence, and a simple mind that is simple in ignorance and with emotion. The Russian leaders are more emotional, and with meditation and strong prayer and a link with all, we can work on the emotion to stabilize it. The problem with Russia has always been the emotion. That's not a bad assessment for an extraterrestrial. So the que que toxic tra So the quixotic travelers completed their journey but they had no way of knowing for certain that their money and faith had been well invested, for at the start they had only the management's word for it, that a crisis was imminent, and at the end they only had the management assurance that they had been instrumental in averting it. However, 
it is perhaps rele relevant to recall that there is a meditation room in the United Nations in the, in the United Nations building in New York, and also that the great modern Indian saint Sri Aurobindo, a man of no mean intellectual capacity, claimed that the strengthening of the Russian resistance during the siege of Stalingrad was due to the power he generated through meditation. The idea of a psychic influence on world events is not exclusive to our extraterrestrial friends and their Ossinian confederates. I have mentioned the 1974 Middle East adventure as an example of an action initiated by the communicators. There are other types of such actions, or rather programs, for work in these several area is continuing. There are investigations of children who can produce the Geller effect of bending metal, there is work with psychic healers, and there is a research program involving dolphins and pop voices, uh, aquatic supermines also allegedly in service with the management. The work of the community and their associates ramifies in many directions and involves activities all over the world some of which have been topics of public attention and debate over recent years. To pursue the ramification of their story is to see emerge a portrait of an age, our age, a portrait in which are delineated its deepest concerns, its discoveries and adventures, its fears, hopes, longings, and yes, perhaps also its follies. Even if the question of the provenance, the authenticity and the veridical content of the communications were put aside, the story would be worth telling just because it focuses and interrelates aspects of the emergent new consciousness of this end quarter of the 20th century. But in the end, the most exciting part of the story is the part that is the most contentious, dubious and hard to swallow. When the parapsychological and sociocultural aspects of the case have been thoroughly explored, there remains to be considering, considered the question whether the communication can conceivably be what they purport to be. Is there even a remote possibility that our planet has long been under the surveillance and occasionally under the direct influence of intelligent forces from some other part of the cosmos. To do the communications justice, we have to venture into this area where speculation is rife and hard facts are difficult to come by. There is a vast literature about UFOs and extraterrestrial visitors to our planet, and to judge by the success of the books von Erich von Däniken, Powells and Bergier and Brinsley, the Poor Trench, there is a large public avid to believe in the existence of the space gods. The unscholarly and wildly conjectural approach adopted in most of the UFO literature has tended to polarise attitudes towards uncritical belief on the one hand and total rejection of the possibilities on the other. Rational men who want no truck with a lunatic fringe can scarcely be prevailed upon rationally to consider such evidence as there is for, for the existence and activities of extraterrestrials. What? Long sentences. Rational men who want no truck with a lunatic fringe can scarcely be prevailed upon rationally to consider such evidence as there is for the existence and activities of extraterrestrials. Some may go as far as Carl Jung went in his 1947 essay Flying Sources and concede that UFOs have a kind of objective existence as psychic extorization phenomena, extorization phenomena, and that the worldwide sightings of them over recent decades are symptomatic of a wave of hope in the reappearance of Christ. Religions, of course, have always taught the existence of a supermundane intelligence and divine intervention in human affairs and history, so the idea is not unfamiliar. And if we take a look at beyond the popular literature and the scholarly acrimony it has engendered, and shelf the plausible Jungian, Jungian hypothesis for a time, we find that a surprising number of people who are in a position to be better informed than most do not find the idea of the existence and intervention of extraterrestrials inherently implausible. 
When I had listened to the first batch of tapes and had begun to take seriously the possibility of venturing upon the present book, I sought through books immediately to hand in my own modest library, and within half an hour turned up a number of facts that began to erode my basic scepticism about extraterrestrials. I found, for instance, that in 1974 an international conference, sponsored jointly by the American and Russian Academies of Science, had been convened in Armenia and had launched Project Cyclops, an international research project on the practical possibilities and foreseeable consequences of establishing contact with extraterrestrial beings. The following year, a symposium entitled Life Beyond Earth and the Mind of Man was organized by Professor Richard Berenson of Boston University. Professor Berenson, an astronomer, stated that recent developments in the sciences strongly indicated the high probability of the existence of extraterrestrial life. He had also suggested, I learned, that an effective way of communicating with extraterrestrials might be through psychic channels. And in a book co-authored by Professor Carl Sagan of Cornell and Professor Joseph Shaklovsky of Moscow University, entitled Intelligent Life in the Universe, the suggestion is put forward that the ancient Sumerians may have had contact with the space people. The researchers of the philosopher-mathematician Dr. Charles Musez into ancient mythology and symbolism point to the same conclusion. Furthermore, the sober calculations of astrophysicists and exobiologists biologists of the possibilities of the existence of an intelligent life elsewhere in the universe are staggering. Dr. Frank Drake of Cornell estimates that one in ten million stars possesses a detectable civilization. This modest figure would yield a total of between a hundred thousand and a million in our galaxy alone. That a proportion of these should be older and technologically more advanced civilizations than ours is a possibility that can hardly be dismissed out of hand without incurring a charge of narrow-minded planetary chauvinism. Our own space technology is barely 15 years old and the Apollo project of landing men on the moon was accomplished within six years of its inception. So who is to say that other civilizations possessed of aeons of technological expertise in advance of ours might not exist and a long ago and long ago have conquered interstellar space and evolved technologies beyond the boldest imagining of our scientists and scientific fiction writers. There were some of the facts and arguments that disposed me to take more seriously than I had on the day I first visited Ossining. The idea that the communications may not be a fraud, delusions or a parapsychological phenomenon, but precisely what John and Andrea believed them to be, messages from the space people. I could think of a score of reasons why the pro proposition was absurd, but if there was the remotest possibility that it might be true, it was obviously worth investigating the evidence more deeply. When I accepted the invitation to be the chronicler of the Ossing group adventure, I confess that just for a moment I entertained the thought that it would be stupid to pass up a possible opportunity to be a, right, to be a witness to a new ap apocalypse. But I suppressed the thought no sooner than it surfaced. Well, well aware that of all the tutorly spirits I could choose to accompany on this particular venture, the most inappropriate would be those that bore the names Faith and Hope. Since the above pages were written, nine months have elapsed. I have listened to the recordings of all the communications participated in some myself and completed this book, and I would now like to add a few pages to this introductory chapter in the light of these new experiences. I was apprehensive when I embarked on this book that I might reach a point where I could no longer continue with the work. It was possible that when I heard more of the material and had analysed it and thought about it, I would become convinced that a perfectly normal, or what I would have called normally paranormal explanation of it, could be plausible, could be plausibly abducted, adduced, in which case I would be obliged by the ethics of intellectual integrity to wield Occam's razor and cut out all extravagant hypotheses, such as the existence of extraterrestrials. But this hasn't happened. Increasingly familiarity 
with the material of the communications and with the people involved has only consolidated my feeling that this is one of the most remarkable true story stories that any writer ever had dropped into his lap and also increased my puzzlement as to where the communications would could emanate from if not from the alleged extraterrestrial intelligence when i first visited osinning and john and john said with a laugh that he wondered whether my appearance at that time was as casual as it seemed and whether the management might not have a plan to use me in some way i frankly thought him crackers but when i listened to the tapes i understood why the thought might have occurred to him two days before i visited osinning in fact on the very day that i arrived in new york and before I had contacted John, he and Andrija were told in a communication, there will be those that will come to you this weekend that will be of benefit. There will be a time when they will walk away, moving their head back and forth and will not understand. But then they will sit and they will think and they will have an experience and they will begin to understand. And then they will work with you. We have decided that those that work with you must begin to have experiences for them to have understanding. That are not many in your physical world that operate on faith, as you do, Sir John. When I asked John whether anyone else had visited or singing that weekend, he couldn't recall whether anyone had, but whether anybody had, but he was certain that no one had visited who had later become involved in the work. He had quite forgotten about the prediction in the communication held on the Friday, but when I drew his attention to it, he said, I'm sure that was intended for you. Well, maybe. After listening through all the tapes, I had become inert to the book of seeing an extraordinary prediction fulfilled. The rest of the above quoted prediction is true, too. That is, if it was intended for me. I did walk away shaking my head, and I did have a couple of experiences of seemingly paranormal effects, though these did not contribute to my understanding so much as to my perplexity. I will relate them because this kind of thing is an integral part of the story, and I trust what is straight reportage will, be, will not be misconstrued as advocacy. These things happen, and nothing remotely like them has ever happened in my experience before. But the only ground I have for associating them with the management is that they happened when they did. The first was a poltergeist type of event. It happened in October 1975, not long after I had received the first parcel of specimen material from John, and at a time when I was debating with myself whether I could undertake this book. Late one night, I, my wife and a friend, watched a television program in the sitting room of my home. The program had a soporific effect on the other two, but I watched it through and at the end walked across the room and switched off the set. I then turned and spoke to the others, and our friend woke up, and at that moment a potted plant on the mantelpiece behind me literally jumped out into the room and landed at my feet. When I realised what had happened, I said to our friend, Did you see that? He said, Yes, he'd seen it. The plant had jumped off the mantelpiece. We sought a, mo <laughs> we sought a normal explanation, the only possible one was that I knocked the plant off switching off the television, but to have done so would have required a most unnatural up-and-round swing of the arm, which I was certain I had not performed. Moreover, the plant, which I, had later, which I later ascertained weighed just over five pounds, had not been toppled, but seemed to have been lifted, for it landed upright, two or three away from the mantelpiece, and the saucer in which it stood was undisturbed. I remembered some of the tales I had heard about paranormal events at Osinin and around Yuri, and I wondered. The second event occurred when I had already begun working on the book. I played through one of the cassette tapes of communication, made notes and transcribing relevant portions as I did so. I left the cassette in my player and did some writing. Then later in the day I wound back to check a point, but now the track was completely blank. It certainly could not have been erased normally in the interim, and it was not until later that I discovered that this particular communication was one of the very few of which there existed a duplicate copy, which suggests that it was deliberately selected for demonstration purposes. I was impressed, much more impressed than I had been 
by reading Andrejas' accounts of the more sensational teleportations and dematerialization events that had occurred in connection with Yuri, which is the reason I don't expect anyone else to be particularly impressed by these two anecdotes, though I think I had to report them as they were events that influenced my attitude to the work and the communication. Another influence has been my own experience of communication session. I have participated in seven sessions over the last nine months. This is mm. not the context to report them in detail, but perhaps a description of what a typical session is like will help the reader to have a mental picture of what is going on when communications are summarized in later chapter. The first communication I participated in was at Osset Hall, the former Whitmore ancestral home in Essex, now owned by, Sir, by John's close friend, Tony Morgan. Phyllis had arrived from New York the previous day. Through listening to the tapes, including the one of her life story, I had formed an impression of a capable, resourceful, extrovert, and probably rather formidable woman. To my relief, I was wrong. Ostentatiously casual in dress and manner, rather short of statue, with short blonde hair styled for convenience, talkative, fun-loving, down-to-earth, seemed, Phyllis seemed as normal and nice a person as one could meet. She is, but she is also some, something much more. She prefers to work late, so it was about one o'clock in the morning when she, John, and I left the other members of the weekend house party talking in the drawing room and went upstairs to Phyllis' room. She and John made the necessary preparations, arranging three upright chairs in close proximity, fixing the recording equipment and putting on the copper bracelet that had been instructed always to wear during sessions that they have been instructed always to wear during sessions. During and for some time after, these prepar uh, during and some, and for some time after these preparations, we considered, we continued the conversation we had been engaged in downstairs, which had nothing to do with our present purpose. Then John said we better begin. Phyllis stopped out her cigarette, composed herself in an upright posture, with her hands resting on her knees, and said she was ready. Whereupon John switched on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether that record. Stopped out and composing herself in an upright posture, with her hands resting on her knees, and said she was ready. Whereupon John switched off the room lights and placed a small torch in a position where it afforded us dim illumination, but did not cast a direct light in Phyllis' direction. Phyllis began counting down from 45, her voice becoming softer and softer, until she fell silent. Her head slumped forward and to the left, and her hands fell loosely down at her side. She remained thus for a minute or two, and then, very slowly, her head rose, her back straightened, and her forearms came up to, her to a horizontal position, so that she was sitting as if holding a tray, but with the palms of her hands turned inwards towards each other. Then her voice whispered, We are here, very low, completely exhaling on the last word. John said, Greetings, Tom, and introduced me. Tom is the name that the spokesman for the communicators had adopted for convenience of address. And here and in the sequel, I shall also use it for convenience. Phyllis' voice soon became stronger. And through her, Tom delivered a courteous, indeed flattering, long speech of welcome to me. The ending of the speech and the invitation to put a question were indicated by Phyllis' hand being lowered to her knee and Tom saying yes. I was impressed by Tom's eloquence. And I was both impressed and surprised to be told at one point in the communication precisely what I was thinking. Tom said, now into your mind at this moment comes the thought that you wonder what you're doing communicating with us. And if it is in truth another form of distant place that is speaking to you. That was indeed what I was thinking. The main subject of this communication was the present book. I was given to believe that my meeting that my meeting John when I did was not fortuitous and that I could bring certain qualities into reporting the communications which someone more closely involved would not be able to contribute. 
not the least among which were doubt, skepticism and objectivity. You will be able to put the questions that will occur to people, Tom said. This is a point I have continually borne in mind while writing this book. Probably the main initial credibility hurdle for readers of this book will be that communications from an extraterrestrial intelligence should come through a trance medium and to conclude this chapter I propose to make a few observations on trance mediumship in general and on Phyllis's in particular. What we were asked to believe happens when Phyllis is in deep trance is that she leaves her body and that Tom, the spokesman for the communicators, takes over control of her body and her voice mechanism. What we see happens in certain what we see happens is certainly consistent with this explanation and the content of the communication is certainly such as to make nonsense of any simplistic sceptic suspicion that it is all a clever play acting on Phyllis' part. But neither the content nor the observed events nor the combination of the two inconclusively proves that this is in fact what happened. So we have to consider whether we have available any way round a simple believe it or not option to ask whether there is any other evidence we can call on which may at least affect the balance of probabilities even if it does not constitute a final elucidation of the truth of the matter. We have three categories of such evidence. Well authenticated precedents from the literature of psychic research. Certain statements that Phyllis has made about her trance experiences when she has returned to a normal waking state of consciousness and relevant statements made in the communications themselves. Let us then see how the balance of probabilities is affected if we consider in turn the separate statements a. that Phyllis leaves her body during trance and b. that Tom takes possession of her body and control of its function. We have ample evidence for the reality of out-of-the-body experiences or to use an older and today less fashionable term astral projections, the voluminous case records and scrupulous analysis of Dr. Robert Crookhall, the testimonies of experience such as Sylvan Muldoon, Oliver Fox and Robert Monroe, and the recent experimental researches of Dr. Putoff and Tark at the Stanford Research Institute and of Professor Charles T. Tart at the University of California, not to mention the many testimonials of people who have undergone psychodeath experiences and been brought back to life. They have established beyond doubt that there is a component of human personality, the bit of me that counts, as one experience called it, that in certain circumstances can separate from the physical body, leaving the latter merely an envelope or a shell. The experience of separation of our essential self from our physical body that occurs somewhere between the many unseen bodies that are said to exist, such as the astral and the etheric, is in fact by no means uncommon, and although for most people who have them, such experiences are involuntarily and rare, and rare, some people have learned and developed techniques for affecting separation at will. So the claim that during trance Phyllis leaves her body is neither outrageous nor inherently improbably, improbable. Most times, most times I'm not anywhere, Phyllis says, referring to the times when she's in trance. She usually returns to normal consciousness as from a sleep, deep, from a deep and dreamless sleep. She never has any recollections of the words she has spoken, but sometimes she retains a vivid impression uh, of places. Um, she has visited while out of the body, and very often her post session reports of her uh, her post session reports of her out of the body experiences closely correspond with the information contained in the related communications. Some examples of these correspondences will be brought to the reader's attention in later chapters. The point I want to make here is that they constitute at least prima facie evidence for the authenticity of both the information and the post-session report. If we accept on the basis of the evidence of physical research and of her own testimony that Phyllis may indeed leave her body when in trance, the next question to consider is whether the vacated body and its functions can be taken over by an exter external agency. On this subject, a very interesting statement was made by Tom 
in a communication in January 1975. The one whom we communicate through is a physical transmitter and has to be a being that is willing, that will become passive in order for us to become active. In order to communicate with you, we must take over the subconscious of the being and at the same time control the physical body. We must, with great effort, maintain a balance in the body. We must cause the body to have its heart operating, its lungs breathing and all its major organs functioning. The reason for the drain of energy many times from the two of you is that we are maintaining the body in a suspended state. The second occasion when I personally participated in the communication was at a remote old house in South Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire, and when Phyllis was coming out of a trance, she moaned and sobbed, rolled, it, rolled her head and screamed in a way that I found most alarming. John, who had conducted the session, did not appear to be perturbed by this performance, however. He held Phyllis Ham firmly and said, I command the immediate release of this being, and the symptoms of distress quickly abated. Tell us what happened, John said, when Phyllis was fully conscious, and she told us a harrowing story about having to battle with another entity for possession of her body when she returned to it. They're still all around us, she said, and I confess I looked around the room with some apprehension, but of course I saw nothing. I asked what were all around, and Phyllis explained that when a human channel is open, scores of spirits and elementals rush to the spot like wasps to a jam pot, seeking to take possession and, and get back into the physical plane. John added, I thought with... John, John added, I thought with impressive nonchalance that there was nothing to worry about really, really because the physical is always stronger than the psychical and the would-be intruders could be driven off with a few well-chosen words, which I thought was nice to know and could come in useful sometime. But the point of this anecdote is that for Phyllis, the possibility of possession by alien entities is very much a reality. It has been a reality too for many people involved in psychical research. To survey the evidence here would require too long a digression, and I can only recommend anyone concerned to pursue the matter to consult Richard Hodgkins, Hodgkins' report on the Lurency Venoms, the Watseka Wonder case, or Dr. Ian Stevenson's on the case of Jasper Judd, James Hislop, who was a professor of logic and ethics at the Columbia University, as well as a notable psychic researcher. He wrote that although he had fought against the idea for ten years, he was finally unable to reject the conclusion that, in a number of cases, persons whose conditions would ordinarily be described as due to hysteria, dual or multiple personalities, dementia, uh, precox, paranoia, or some other form of mental disturbances, showed unmistakable indication of invasion by foreign or discarnate agencies. Hislop, mean, Hislop meant spirits, but his foreign agencies could just as well have been extraterrestrial intelligences. In the light of the evidence surveyed in the above paragraphs, I suggest that we may consider the antecedent improbability of the proposition that in a trance, Phyllis leaves her body and Tom takes over. Greatly diminished. The doubt was greatly diminished. If the reader agrees, he will have cleared the first of the credibility hurdles. And if he stays with this narrative, the exercise will serve him in good stead, for there are many more and much bigger hurdles to come. Now, I thought that was absolutely fascinating, his report of how it all started. And in the next few days, I will start the chapter two, which is called The Forming of the Triangle. And it is quite extraordinary, this story of a scientist, a psychic and an aristocrat, who were brought together in order to help mankind through the time of crisis and don't we just need all of this so i wish you a really good tuesday i will upload it on my youtube bye